Um, first of all, I would like to give a warm good evening or good morning, depending where you're looking at us from, where you're watching this webinar from. I want to thank you all for being again with us after one and a half weeks, almost two weeks since our last tele uh, webinar that we do on the instance of governance and sustainability in the con coronavirus times. This is a joint initiative that was established by the European Public Organization, the Institute for Sustainable Development and the Aneosis. And I would like to uh, introduce here Thodoris Georgakopoulos, who is the editorial director of the Aneosis. Thodori, welcome again with us. Thank Hi. you for being with us. Great to be here. And I would like to uh, invite to our today's discussion, which will be about the issue of economic recovery versus the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, and whether this will be a case that the Sustainable Development Goals will work in tandem with the effort to redress the economy after the coronavirus pandemic, or whether there will be a conflict between the two. And to discuss this, we have two really very exquisite speakers with us. We have uh, Ms. Alexandra Mitsotaki, who is the co-founder and president of the World Human Forum and president of Siglisis, the Convergence Greece Forum. Alexandra, welcome. Uh, thank you for being with us from Paris. And also, I would, like, and I would like also to invite uh, Dr. Stefanos Fotiu, who is the Director of Environment and Development Division for the United Nations Economic and Social Committee for Asia and Pacific. Uh, Mr. Fotiu, thank you so much for being with us from uh, Bangkok, Thailand. It's pretty late for you right there. Huh? Thank you, Spiros. Good evening. It's, it's a nice evening. Okay. Thank you very much, all. Um, as you've probably seen in the introduction for uh, what we will be discussing today, we want to check and, and see whether the process that will be starting as countries are coming out of the lockdown gradually, our own country in Greece is coming out on Monday through the very first careful steps on the 4th of May, and other countries will follow suit or are already doing this. And we expect that governments will be making a major effort to redress the economy and address the big economic crisis that will follow all this shutdown of, of the global economy. And the thing that we need to see is from both a social and environmental perspective, how the uh, issue of redressing the economy will be dealt with in terms of sustainability, because it could work as a lever to support sustainability or it could backfire and actually in the process of trying to establish the economy work as a bulldozer that will take everything away. I will not say much because our speakers are very good and I want Sodorizio Rokopoulos as our commentator to, uh, to have a very active role today because it's a both socio-economic and, and environmental issue and the analysis has a lot of experience of these things. So I think we should go with the principle of ladies first and ask uh, Ms. Alexandra Mitsotaki to take the floor first for five or seven minutes for your introductory uh, remarks. Alexandra. Um, good afternoon and thank you for inviting me, but uh, I want to thank you even more for organizing this discussion because I profoundly believe that this is the most important topic we need to discuss today. Obviously, we are still all very focused on the coronavirus and on the way to deal with it, but profoundly we know that we are going to get over the coronavirus. I don't think anybody doubts that uh, in a few weeks, in a few months, a year at the latest, we will have a cure, we will have a vaccine, and this will be part of the past. What we don't know is how we are going to deal with the other crisis that we might be facing as humanity, which is actually the big the biggest challenge of all, how to create a sustainable future, socially inclusive and environmentally uh, respecting the boundaries of the earth for all of us. And I think therefore that this is the big question of our time. And here we have an opportunity because what has happened with the coronavirus is that governments have simply pushed the pause button. They have pushed the post button on the economy. And this is an unprecedented uh, event for all of us. And we're experiencing something profoundly new. So I would like to start with maybe three lessons that we can already learn from what has happened in the recent weeks uh, and months, but also with the first observation. The observation is that we have 
already partially an answer of where we are going to go from here on, because our governments and societies in general have already made a choice. They have prioritized human lives uh, over the economy. I'm not sure uh, if that was necessarily predictable, but I think that we live in a period of history where never before human life has been valued so much. And therefore, it seemed the obvious thing to do for most of our governments. And those who didn't do it immediately, they had to do it a little bit later, but they ended up doing it more or less all of them. And in fact, by doing that, um, they have clearly given us an indication. Now, um, what is the and, and I would like to add also that those who are criticizing this decision uh, by saying that um, maybe we should have prioritized the economy don't say it directly and they are right actually to say that we have to be very careful about the economic consequences but what they say is that the economic cost of putting everybody in a lockdown can be much uh, more important and have bigger cost for human lives and human suffering than we realize. But there again, we seem to be prioritizing the human. So what can be the lessons that we can learn from the corona, um, this crisis, for the next crisis that we will be facing? And here I see actually at least three lessons. The first is that we live in an interdependent world now, and that has to be accepted and understood by everybody. Uh, boundaries, uh, walls, uh, borders cannot protect us anymore. If this small virus was able to go around the world so quickly, uh, imagine what will be the consequences of climate change. Can we really believe that when the seas will be rising, when we'll be having a mega uh, fires and floods around the world that we will be protected by our borders and by the walls we will be we will be building, obviously not. Same thing goes for migration, uh, migration due to um, climate refugees. Same thing goes for violence when people will fight over rare natural resources. So the first thing is that we have to accept once and for all that we live in an interdependent world. The second point is that we have to accept, and I think we learned it, that we need to listen to scientists. We need to listen to science, we need to respect knowledge. We live at a time which is very dangerous because of all the fake news and everybody having access to knowledge, but at the end of the day, we have to learn and listen again to science. And the third point, which I think is uh, uh, actually probably the most important one, is that we have learned that preparation, prevention, long-term thinking is what we lack most. Because if we had listened to those voices that have been telling us a few years ago that we might be at the risk of a pandemic, we didn't listen to those voices and we didn't want to think uh, further ahead than uh, the next day. And if that is true again for a pandemic, imagine how true this is for issues like uh, protecting biodiversity or uh, climate issues. So again, we must understand that unless we do today what is required for tomorrow, we as humanity will be unable to face the crises we will be facing. So uh, finally, I would like to stop this first intervention by saying that the good news here is that we already have a small indication of where we will be going in the next day. And we have this indication both from the level of governments and also from the level of citizens and society. From the level of governments, I think that um, uh, we see in Europe at least a very clear positioning by French President Macron, uh, who clearly spoke about needing to reinvent the economic system. He, he even went further saying that we need to reinvent ourselves. He spoke about reinventing himself. More prosaically, Chancellor Merkel uh, over, or earlier this week, um, at the conference from St. Petersburg, uh, wanted to raise the, um, the CO2, CO2 uh, emission level by, uh, or lower the CO2 emission to a level from 40% to 50% by 2030, uh, making therefore a bigger effort to go into a more sustainable uh, system. 
So I think we have an indication as far as our governments go uh, that the European Green Deal and the vision of making at least Europe um, um, a more sustainable society um, is still very much on track. Uh, but equally importantly for me is what citizens believe and think and what uh, and how they have experienced that crisis. And there, very clearly again, I, th I, I think we see uh, lots of indications uh, that citizens have been shocked by what has happened, but that they realize now um, that the issues that we are discussing, uh, sustainability around the environment and social inclusion, uh, have to be now prioritized. And we have polls in the UK um, and we have the uh, Climate Citizen Convention in France where 150 citizens have been uh, arbitrarily uh, put together to discuss the climate policy for France and very clearly they have gone much further than what we were expecting them to go. So I think we have some indications and we can be optimistic that we're going to succeed. And the good news, and there we hand over to Mr. Futil, is that we know also much more than what we did 10 years ago when the 2008 financial crisis hit us. Because back then, we weren't so sure how to do it. Were renewables a real uh, alternative? Were they cheap enough? Did we really, could we really bet on electric transport, electric cars? All those things have made huge progress over the last 10 years, and we have now uh, alternatives at all levels to really make the Green Deal a reality. Thank you very much, Alexandra. And I really appreciate that you, you close your first intervention with giving us the good news and the positive note on how things can go, because if we only see this as a doomsday, there will not be very much backing for going ahead with that. I noted a number of points, but I will not comment on that. Anyway, I think it is mostly the job of, of uh, Thodoris to do the commenting, but I will just uh, be playing in some cases the devil's advocate as well with, with questions to just provoke the discussion afterwards. But before we do any of this, I would like to ask Stefanos Fortiu to take the floor for another five or seven minutes. Stefano, please. Uh, thank you very much, Peros, and of course, thanks to everybody that is joining this um, uh, webinar. Uh, thank you for organizing this, and congratulations that two uh, very important think tanks, they have put this together. Um, I must say also uh, that I feel very, a very good emotional state right now, because it's the first time after 16 years that I left Greece that I'm participating on a web in, or on an event that is organized by two organizations that they have headquarters in, in, in Greece and I feel very proud about this. I, I want to start from where Ms. Mitsotaki actually um, started with her, her message that is the big good surprise was the prioritization of the human life over the economy. And I think that what I would like to add is that I hope that the recovery could show another signal and is the prioritization of the natural environment and ecosystems over an unsustainable economy. So let me just start by sharing with you how was the first weeks um, that I started working under the COVID and what was the thoughts that I have as someone that's working in the environment the last 25 years. After the first couple of weeks of the isolation and the closing down, we start showing some pictures of animals returning back to their natural environment, clean skies over Bangkok, the city in which I'm living, and for many uh, months we were suffering from air pollution, clean skies over um, uh, India, clean skies over all the cities that they are suffering from pollution. We saw the waters cleaning. But as, a, as people that we are working on environment, we also saw and we listened today, uh, International Environmental Agency saying that we are gonna have a 8% reduction on greenhouse gases emissions. But the problem is that we cannot be cheerful with this because all these are coming at the expenses of jobs, at the expenses of lives. So the first message is that, and I think the first lesson I'm taking from this crisis that is that this is not the kind of environmental protection and climate mitigation we want. We want the climate mitigation and environmental protection that at the same time is based on green and healthy economies. And we don't need to stop the economy in order to protect the environment. 
And I think that this crisis will show us that we have the tools to do the two things together. And uh, as Ms. Michotaki uh, shared some, some lessons, I want also to share a couple of lessons that um, I think we're learning from this crisis. And, and actually, a couple of them were very similar with what Ms. Michotaki shared. And I want to start with a similar lesson, which is about the scientists and the scientists. And I think that when we are about to face and when we are about now to design our action for confronting the climate change, we need not only to put the science first, but to understand that science is not negotiable. Sometimes we are, may not like what science says because it might hurt some vested interest, but science is not negotiable. And this is a very important message, I think, for the climate negotiations, which we have seen the last two years, how much they are in a big bottleneck because countries cannot even accept the basic facts of science. A second lesson um, I think we are learning is that the global value chains are not ready to respond to this crisis. So value chains of very important commodities um, are not ready to handle another crisis. But they show and they exhibit a very big level of adaptation. And I think that because they have exhibited this level of adaptation, we can have a lot of hopes that they will become also responsive to the next crisis. A third lesson, which I think is very important, is that um, we need to, for the future, to focus on reestablishing the symbiotic relation between humans and the natural environment. I mean, humans are part of ecosystems. I mean, we are living parts of the ecosystem. It happened uh, because of the evolutionary process that we became the dominant species, but we are still operating in an ecosystem. We are operating in an ecosystem that provides to us um, uh, a lot of services, and we are using the services for, uh, for economic activity. And I want to conclude my, my five minutes by saying that um, what I think it's the way forward is looking at the uh, option of common goods. And we saw with this crisis that countries that they have invested in the common, uh, common goods of health, of social protection, they have done better responding to the pandemic. So I think we need to continue investing in common goods, but we need to expand the investments from health and social services to the common goods of clean air, of clean water, and all these common goods that they will make our lives better. Let me just close by saying that uh, I share the optimism of uh, Ms. Mitsotaki. I think that uh, the future will be better because this unprecedented disruption of the system uh, will make humans adapt. And um, the humans have been the dominant species actually because they are able to adapt. And I think this is a point that we will all adapt and uh, we will behave better. What I think is really needed is that um, when we are responding, when we are recovering, when we are adapting, we need to put in the first line the ones that we usually left behind. And in the case, for example, of climate change, the ones that they are left behind is poor farmers, is the climate migrants, is people living in very poor conditions in uh, cities, in city slums. And this should be the, the, first, uh, the first attention. So I think that environmental protection, social inclusion, and a healthy economy is positive. Uh, and I would like to uh, end my first introduction with this period. Thank you. hear me. Thank you very much, Stefani. I really enjoyed uh, listening to your points that underline the series of very important things. Uh, let me just refer very quickly before I ask Todoris to, to comment and ask any questions he might want to, to this uh, op-ed, this uh, opinion document that was published yesterday, if I remember right, in the New York Times by the uh, Secretary General of the United Nations, where he was outlining six uh, key strategies and key directions that need to be taken by the uh, world economy and the world leaders so that the shift for the new economy goes to a more green and sustainable way rather than just doing the same things again. And it has been very strongly reinforced by what we heard from you. Uh, I will not say much now. Uh, I would like to ask Todoris Yorakopoulos from the Aneos to take the floor and uh, provide us please with your first comments and first opinions. Well, 
Thank you so much, Peterson. Thank you for your useful remarks to our guests. I've taken down some notes and I'm going to be asking you a lot of questions uh, later on. I have four, three small points I want to make and also I'd like to read one of the questions that have been uh, popping up on our Q&A. The first point I would like to make is that there is one positive consequence of the crisis uh, and that's that people around the world suddenly realize that funds, trillions of dollars in euro, euros actually become available when a truly global crisis arises that everyone can see and understand. And we see this happen for the first time uh, in a very, very long time since the world wars. So we see uh, illustrated before us the fact that the tools are there for a global response to a global crisis. It's not a perfect reaction, uh, obviously, especially because we have uh, seen a, a rise of um, many countries deciding to go it alone. Uh, but it is a global response. And when we are talking about problems, that the problems that are described by the SDGs, those are all global problems. And up to now, uh, global responses was something that we were aspiring, that we were uh, requesting. And now governments uh, see that around the world, other governments are um, coming up with innovative ways and billions and trillions of funds to actually tackle something that's really, really important and serious, which makes the, um, the, the main challenge that we have to highlight uh, the urgency of all these other problems that the SDGs stand for. The other point I'm, I would like to make is that next week we will be hearing a bit more about the EU stimulus program. Trillions of euros are going to be allocated. The EU budget is rumored to double. And the questions uh, that uh, arise uh, are on where does that leave the Green New Deal? How it will be changed or adapted or integrated into the stimulus program? So that is something very interesting to hear about and, and to discuss. And another point is that there are some, uh, another important challenge is that oil prices are going to be very low for a very long time. Uh, and their oil is going to become a very cheap energy source for a long time. So when we come back from the health crisis, there is going to be an enormous push for a quick return to growth. And trying to achieve that, governments may backtrack on our sustainable growth goals. Uh, and then that's also something that I would like to hear our uh, panelists discuss. How can we advocate? How can def we defend uh, the policies that were in place before the crisis and we don't fall back into the bad practices of the past when it comes to energy consumption and achieving growth. And there's a great question from our Q&A section already. Um, uh, someone says that uh, the idea of an interdependent world that uh, Ms. Mitsotakis mentioned is a great one, but what does this mean for scaling up community innovations which always prioritize people over profit? How, does, how can that scaling up take place? So that's my first question and my first um, raising of subjects uh, that I think are interesting to discuss. Thank you very much, Todori, for this. Um, as, as I said before, I will not try to make things easy for you. Um, what I will try to do is, first of all, there are a number of questions that are coming through from different parts of the world and I will refer to them. But before I do so, I wanted to just slam on you a number of statistics that will show how big the problem is, not only for you to understand, but also for the people that are watching us. Let me just give you an, an idea that um, the unemployment numbers that we're talking about are estimated in the United States. This is what the uh, statistics that we got from are. They are expected to reach anywhere between 20 to 45%. 45% at the time that if you compare with the highest level of unemployment in the United States in 1933 at the time of the Great Recession was 25%. Now we're waiting, we're expecting that it might reach even up to 45%. And that is not only the case for the United States, but you can imagine in places where they have more precarious jobs, that numbers will be much worse, like poor farmers, migrants, slums that, that Stefanos 
uh, referred to. But then there is also, uh, there are segments of people that are working in special specific industries. For example, artists. Artists are not very much covered. And one thing that Bill Gates said about a couple of weeks ago uh, was that what we used to know is concerts and arenas and things will not exist for at least one to two years. So all these concerts that were making the livelihood of people that are in arts are something that will not exist. And of course, other types will, will start existing like, you know, web-based and so on, but it's not the same. Restaurants, uh, the food industry. Restaurants will be obliged to work with maximum about 50% of all the people they could host before. And they had already a very thin margin of profit. Now, if we cut their income by half, will they be able to survive? And the people working in them that are doing, you know, um, uh, temporary jobs or so will be out. Airlines, same thing. Airlines are already planning to lay off people because they will not be able to fly as many people. They have to leave one seat empty. So with a 33% decrease in the number of, of uh, people they carry, will they be able to survive? And all of this system are people that will be put on the line. Um, all of these are just to, to give you an indication. And then there is an opinion that I was reading the other day by a gentleman called Rory Sullivan. He was named Personality of the Year in last year's Sustainable Investment Awards. He said that uh, we know that the governments will try to provide a lot of support, but this support in the typical Keynesian economy way, um, is it support again for building um, basic infrastructure works like more airports and more ports and more cement and all this? Or will it be for supporting renewable energy, for example, that can give many jobs? It is a choice and it is a political decision on what will be done. Same thing for, for uh, the food production. Food production is very is actually at the core of what we're having today because it has been proven that lots of pandemics are emerging from the way that we are rearing and we're growing animals. So there is a very big change on how we grow food and all this that needs to be taken into account. And finally, because I said I want to, to mention also the questions and answers, I, I have to say that I'm very impressed that we have one question that is coming all the way from Zimbabwe, from the founder and chief executive of the Rosari Memorial Trust. And I want to thank him online for being with us today. And uh, after commenting about Alexandra's and, and Stefano's comments, he's asking uh, what our opinion means about scaling up community innovations, which always prioritize people over profit and whether we would be able to do this. Um, so this is one question. We have more questions uh, looking into the need to reduce the expectations of people that are in work in terms of, um, of returns, in terms of what they can take back from their efforts because we need to support a more intensive growth scheme and whether growth is the only thing that we should be looking at or not. And how you can combine this with more participation, and I'm looking at Alexandra right now, because social participation is important, and a more sustainable environmental way of doing things. So with these points, I open again the floor for your uh, interventions, and that includes Todori, you as well. If there is any point you want to share, just feel free to, to step in. So who would like to take the floor? Alexandra? Okay, so I go first again. Um, I would like to start with a question from Zimbabwe. I would like, first of all, to say that my personal experience comes from uh, almost 20 years of working in the global south, in the development sector, fighting poverty and exclusion and inequalities through an organization called ActionAid. And um, I have to say that um, back then when I engaged in that direction, I was fully uh, conscious that the, the, the most important thing for me was the issue of social exclusion, inequalities and poverty. But I learned over the years that it goes hand to hand, absolutely it's the other side of the coin, the environmental sustainability. And this I think is something we must all remember and all always accept that you cannot fight poverty, exclusion and inequalities without making the world sustainable environmentally. So this is very important. And the other thing I learned over my years traveling in Africa and in the global south is that local communities have indeed a huge role to play and a huge capacity to find solutions and add value. And that poor and excluded people themselves have to be in the driving seat 
when we are looking for solutions. And scaling up might not always be possible at the highest level, but we can learn from local communities. And I think that being grounded and having ownership for poor and excluded people, but for all citizens, actually, I think the same thing is valid for our developed economies in our countries. Being a global citizen and being concerned about what's happening around the globe, it, we are obliged to do it because as we say, uh, we are living in an interdependent system, but world. But that doesn't mean that we are not rooted in our local communities. And I don't think anything good can happen unless we all cherish our roots, have ownership of our local community actions, and a regenerated world will only be possible if we use that rootedness and the capacity of local communities to come up with integrated um, uh, processes and uh, solutions for their own for their own communities and the other thing i would like to say is that um, the word cooperation has to stand up very high now on, on everybody's agenda and when we speak about cooperation it's not only cooperation between governments or between regions of the world it is also because who will be able to implement this new agenda we are talking about. Let's go back to the sustainable development goals. Who is responsible for it in the end? And there, I think it is very clear that it will never happen unless governments cooperate with the private sector, with the business sector, unless civil society gets involved equally at the same level, and of course, at the end, individuals and citizens. This is something we all have to share. It is not possible to leave it anymore uh, in the hands of either governments or the corporate sector. It won't happen without all that um, convergence of all of those uh, uh, elements. So unless we go down that road and we understand that, we will certainly not, um, not uh, find a solution. Um, so yeah, that's, um, that's for the moment. Peter, I think you are muted. Yes, I am. Thank you. Stephanie, would you like, I mean, I, um, I thank yes. Alexandra, and if you'd like to follow on. Yes, I'll, um, I'll try to start from uh, something that Fodor is uh, said about the extremely low prices of oil that we will face for the next phase. And I want to go back, Spiros, I think the solution actually to this is, um, is, is based on two of the six messages that the Secretary General of the United Nations actually outlined in, in uh, this op-ed that you mentioned in the New York Times. And it was also actually his submission to the Petersburg uh, Climate Dialogue. So two of the very concrete things that the Secretary General proposes, first, end the fossil fuel subsidies. And I want to highlight the word that the Secretary General has used. He said, end the fossil fuel subsidies. He didn't say rationalize. He didn't say reduce, he said end. Now, in the European Union, which is the most energy cautious and most green energy um, uh, politically correct uh, region of the world, do you, you know that we still spend 75 billion euros per year on fossil fuel subsidies, 75 billion per year. Remember that the money that it was allocated for the small and medium enterprises for the COVID crisis were 50 billion. So we have 75 billion that they are going to fossil fuels. And now with the reduced price, they should stop going. And they should stop going immediately. The second thing that the Secretary General said, put a price on carbon. And I think it's very fair to put a price on carbon because this will make some behaviors that might be not the ones that we really need now. For example, um, should I take, after the crisis finishes, a plane to go 10,000 kilometers just to enjoy um, a cocktail in the other part of the world? Probably no. Probably we should see how transport could focus on some other things, how transport could become uh, a sector that it will focus on decarbonizing on, on green energy. So I think that because of the low prices of the oil, we have an amazing ability right now to stop bad practices that was happening on, on oil. 
And I want to share an example here because um, also many people say, you know, if you cut the, subs the, f the subsidies on the f fossil fuels, and if you put the price on carbon, then people will revolt. They will not revolt if they see that their money that they are savings, they go back to social and environmental investments. And there is an example from the, from the place of the world that I'm working on the last 10 years, which is Asia Pacific, is the example of Indonesia. The president of Indonesia, when he was first time elected six years ago, he cut the subsidies on gas relief. And everybody was saying that he's gonna fall the next day. He didn't fall and he was reelected. Why? Because all the money that he saved from the fossil fuel subsidies, he put it on social and environmental investments. Indonesia, Jakarta has its first metro line because it doesn't have fossil fuel subsidies anymore. Let me also go to a question I see uh, from the public, from Mr. Fakhrudin, who is asking what should be the environmental bottom lines to apply when we start the recovery. I, I would say that I will three, put three bottom lines there. One is the carrying capacity of ecosystems to um, maintain life. And we do have the science, we do know how to estimate this carrying capacity. We do know that ecosystems could support a lot of economic activities up to one limit after the which they will not be able to support. The second, um, I think, is the line that is posed, and, and Spiros, I'm coming to your point, by the food systems. I think that we need to focus on the food systems because they become the most important public systems in the world right now when it comes not only to economy, but to environmental sustainability and what we will call planetary health. 30% of greenhouse gases emissions are because of the food systems. And another thing that the food systems have done is that they have destabilized completely the cycle of nitrogen in, in, in our planet. So if we make the food systems in, uh, more sustainable, I think that's gonna be a, th a very big step. And a third bottom line, I think for the environment, it has to do with uh, the uh, air pollution. And here I'm going also to uh, um, another uh, question I see from Ms. Papathanasiou. Uh, air pollution has different causes in different cities. In Bangkok, where I'm living, air pollution is mostly caused by agricultural burning. Mm -hmm. In other uh, cities, like New Delhi, for example, it's caused by, by traffic. We have the solutions, and these solutions are not science fiction. It's real technology that it's cost effective and it can be applied. So I think that starting from a practical measure, which is the air pollution, which it has the double benefit of improving the health of the people and reducing the greenhouse gas emissions. It's another first step. I think I'll stop here and maybe we we'll go for another round of uh, answers later. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, you will definitely have at least an opportunity for one last comment before we wrap up and we still have uh, about 15 minutes. So relax. I mean, we have time to discuss. Thodori, uh, over to you if you want to intervene again with some points and questions. There, there are several interesting questions at the Q&A section, but I would like to add one of them, uh, one more, and I would like the comment of our panelists on this. We see a resurgence of nativism. Uh, many countries close their borders. Each country tries different policies to counter the crisis. There is limited coordination on working on drugs and vaccines, very limited cooperation producing and providing supplies. That shows that once this crisis became global, most countries and most regions of the world closed up. Now, when we discuss the problems that we are facing uh, when it comes to sustainable growth and uh, the SDGs, those are global problems that require cooperation. And the idea of global cooperation seems to have dealt a blow during this current crisis. Do you see that this wound will remain and it will have an impact as we move forward or do you think that there is still a chance uh, even during this crisis for nations to cooperate closer uh, or as closely as they used to before the crisis uh, as we move forward thank you very much Sotori. does uh, somebody want to take it directly um, i can start if you want absolutely so I'll, I'll put here the experience we have uh, the last two months in the UN system 
where you know we have disrupted because we have many meetings that we couldn't do. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about uh, capacity development meetings or knowledge meetings. I'm talking about official intergovernmental meetings. And you know, in the UN, this is where the decisions are taken. So we had to innovate. Of course, we are using virtual technology. I, I have to say that in the beginning, many uh, countries were a little bit surprised how we're going to do negotiations with Zoom and with MS Teams. But when we started actually engaging with the countries in these official discussions through these means, we saw an amazing participation and engagement. And I think that's something, uh, it's an extremely positive message that we get back. We saw the countries not only sharing concerns, but start sharing solutions. So in the post COVID area, I'm not sure for the risk if we will travel more Maybe we will travel less, but I think we will cooperate more because countries have seen what is the value that they can learn from each other. I think that also the COVID crisis saw that when the scientific community, when the doctors came together, they started sharing information. They didn't, they didn't care about patents anymore. They didn't care about who is going to publish first. It's another example of why the world will come together and, and closer. I have a very strong belief on the multilateral system, and that's why I'm in the UN, actually. If I would not believe on the, UN, on the multilateral system, I wouldn't have been there. I think the multilateral system will emerge stronger after this crisis. But I think that there's going to be a very big internal discussion in the multilateral system on how it should adapt itself, actually, to serve a new development reality. And I'm seeing this discussion coming. I see our Secretary General and also uh, executives of other international agencies being very anxious on how this discussion will go. But I think this will happen. I don't know if it will happen months or a couple of years after we recover, but I think that this will be an opportunity for the multilateral system to become more people, planet and prosperity oriented and deliver better uh, for all people. I'll, I'll stop here on this question. Thank you. I would like to add here that probably and hopefully the same thing is going to happen at the European level and for the European Union. It is true that, there is, that the first shock was such that there was um, uh, everybody was sort of thinking about closing up. But uh, um, following that first shock, I think it is clear that for the European Union, this is an opportunity now. And the only way forward for Europe is to go a step further down and a step further in the implementation, not only of the Green Deal, but of solidarity between the North and the South of Europe, between small and big countries, between countries that have been hit more and less. So I am actually quite optimistic that the need, the need to find solutions uh, will be such that and it can only happen at the regional level in Europe and therefore I believe that cooperation in the end and the uh, enforcement of the European unity will be actually the outcome of this. Maybe it didn't seem like this the first day, but over the weeks uh, we are going in that direction. Thank you, Alexandra, and thank you, Stefane. Um, as we're approaching the end of this session, we have another five minutes, but we'll cheat a little bit and take another two or three so I can allow the two speakers to have a final point and then Thodoris to make a roundup. Um, so I will not be taking the floor anymore, but just to thank everybody at the end of the session. However, there are a, po a number of points that I collected from what you said and also from questions that came up. I was very interested by what uh, Alexandra said about the localization and the ownership. In the previous session that we had two weeks ago, one of the speakers said that this problem of the pandemic, and it will probably be the same with climate change, is too big to solve only on a global basis, and it has to be solved on a local basis. So um, changes on what is happening with ownership, on what is happening with employment and the relations with the people that work and their expectations are very important. And we are probably talking about a deep change in the economy that is taking us to uh, a new economic system, a post-capitalism system. I want you to note this, especially I'm looking at you, Alexandra, because through the World Human Forum, you touch on questions like this, but of course, taking into account the environmental values and the other human and social values is very important. So it's not a question only for you, but also for Stefanos. Um, 
We also have a question that uh, in some cases we're, we're taking steps back. There was a case that uh, humans were looking at having more of a shared economy. So instead of buying a car, uh, just buying a ride through systems like Lyft, Uber and all this, all these systems of sharing economy have been very badly slammed by the coronavirus. Um, even co-working spaces have been badly slammed by it. And I, nobody knows how much and if they will be able to recover. And so the uh, need to, to find such solutions at the local level, we actually had a very interesting question from the Stanford University from Rich and Villages, and I want to thank our friends in the USA uh, being with us now, um, is how we can go back into shared economy. There is another big challenge uh, that we have been discussing with some colleagues from Singlesis, saying that um, there was a big movement to try to reduce the quantity of plastic on the planet with the reaction that is now planned for the reaction to the spread of the virus, plastic production is taking a huge, huge level. And it would probably be a very important time to look into the solution of this problem now. What we'll do with all this plastic that in some cases cannot even be recycled. Um, so all of these things are very important. And one more question that goes to both of you is one question we had from Kazakhstan about the need to take care specifically of women and children and to provide vocational training and capacity so that they're not left out from the economic, um, the economic uh, system and the economic activity. Because if you forget about the most vulnerable ones, definitely women and children are among those. These are just questions that I'm flagging up. As I said, I will be putting the difficult questions. So I would like both of you to take the floor for another few minutes, two, three minutes, if you can, and then Thodoris to make a roundup of the points because our time is almost done. Whoever of the two speakers wants to raise his hand, you're free to go. I, I could start so we, yes, so we give the final word to uh, Ms. Mitsotaki uh, to okay. be more gender balanced. Yes. Um, uh, Spiros, um, I want, by responding to you, to respond to a couple of questions I saw also in the chat, and I think they are very uh, important. On the localization, yes, the um, global solutions will need to be applied at the local level. I agree with this. On the different types of economy, I'm, I'm not going to be very pleasant here because I'm not sure that the sharing economy was promoting actually sustainable models. I have not been convinced that the, uh, all these business models uh, were promoting less consumption. Uh, I'm very convinced that they were extremely smart business model that probably gave um, good opportunities for, um, uh, for new business models, but I'm not at all convinced that they were sustainable. I, I, I need to put a point here that if you look at this uh, sharing economy um, efforts, you will see that behind each of them, at the end, they ended up having billions of dollars invested by big financial companies. So I can't really say that, you know, um, I, I, will, I will say that it's sharing economy, something that has billions of dollars by, by big financial institutions. I think what we could see is the community level involvement and uh, probably a re-emergence of the small and medium enterprises that could be strengthened after this crisis. I want to finish my, uh, you know, my, my wrap up by focusing on one question about the insurance uh, companies and, and what something can learn from this. I think it's a fantastic question because we are working now, at least in, in my, uh, I wanted to say laboratory because we are doing more research, I think, on putting together two concepts uh, and try to find out how they will help us to respond. One is the, I made a reference to the concept of planetary health. So how we can ensure that we reestablish the symbiotic relation between humans and the ecosystem, and we have measures that they will preserve the human health and the ecosystem functionality. The second concept we try to put together is the concept that is called the society of risk. And the society of risk says to us that now, our position in different classes will not depend so much on how much money and how much resources we have, but how much risk we are able to absorb. And of course, sometimes there's a one-to-one -one relation. The poor people have more risks, 
but sometimes these um, issues are not very clear. So I think the response of our society to the risk uh, and not the response to the allocation of money or allocation of production means will determine the sustainability and the resilience of the system. And I think this is an area that we need to look very carefully, how we will start making our cost and benefit analysis, our net present value analysis, not on the basis of the financial uh, means, but on the basis of the risk for the society, for the people, and especially for the groups that they left behind and they are more vulnerable like the children and the women. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stefano. Thank you very much for all you shared with us. Alexandra, would you like to uh, close with your points? Yes, I would like to go back a step again and go back to um, a word that I think is important here, which is values. Values, purpose, meaning in life for all of us. Uh, because at the end of the day, and uh, um, uh, we have lots of evidence now, uh, also through happiness economics, uh, what we need might not be what we have been uh, taught that we need. At the end of the day, uh, when we reach a certain level of uh, uh, material well-being, our priorities shift. And obviously, this is something we cannot hear right now because we are in the midst of, as you said, uh, Spiros, uh, terrible economic crisis with huge unemployment and huge new poverty rising. But if we don't remember that, we will probably not uh, be able to move in, in the right direction. And um, there, I believe that uh, um, the shift of values towards uh, less competition and more cooperation, uh, towards what is essential to us. And I think the fact that we stopped uh, all of us and were closed in our own homes for so long now gave us time also to reflect on the values and in the direction we want to go as humanity. And uh, this I think we must not underestimate because it is only if we have a change in values and in our worldview of what we want for ourselves and for our children that we will be able to make that shift and take on the terrible burden and the terrible challenge we are going to face all together through this crisis that honestly uh, I'm not rejoicing in the fact that we can see the Himalayas from Kathmandu and that we have dolphins in our, um, in our seas again close to the coast because I agree with Mr. Futil, it shouldn't have happened like that. It should have happened out of our own decisions to move our economy and our society in the right direction. But as long as we uh, don't start with thinking about our values as long and as long as we don't understand that probably we will have no choice anymore than to invent a new system and i don't think in a conversation of 45 minutes we can talk about that new system really but just accepting the need to look for a new system for a new economy for a new type of growth because this is not about not having growth personally i'm agnostic about growth in some fields we need growth in others we don't i fully agree yes let's scrap the subsidies on uh, fossil fuel let's invest more in renewables the good news is that we're not like back in 2008 where we didn't believe that the renewables could ever be as cheap as they are now so that they're really competitive with oil so at the end of of the day it will be really up to us humans to decide where we want to go but probably we don't have much choice because I'm afraid that uh, what we heard back in 72 and I was a student back then from the Club of Rome in their famous limits of growth report today is very clear we have no choice whether we like it or not we will have to find a new way of doing, a new way of living together. And maybe at the end, uh, what I would like to close with is to say that uh, if we think back in the 90s, when this famous quote from the Bill Clinton campaign uh, became so famous, it's the economy stupid. I would like people to remember our time as the time where we finally are able to say it's the human stupid. And if that is not the case, then we won't make it.
it's the humans and the planet probably. Thodori, uh, would you like to make a wrap up so that we can uh, come to the close of our session today? So we touched upon so many, so many issues that uh, it's impossible to wrap up in a couple of minutes. Um, but what I would like to do is uh, read three excerpts that I get. Uh, one from an anonymous attendee at the Q&A section uh, of the comments. He writes that in the past, the world has witnessed sharp spikes in emissions as it has come out of economic recessions. The world will need to make drastic changes to avoid this happening again. The second quote is by Alexandra Mitsutaki. She just said it, we need to invent a new system. And despite the fact that that's going to be hard, she said that just accepting the need to invent it is a start. And the third quote is something that Bill Gates wrote in an article at the, uh, in The Economist last week. When historians write the book on the COVID-19 pandemic, what we've lived through so far will probably take up only the first third or so. The bulk of the story will be what happens next. And that's what we've been discussing for 45 minutes. I think it was a really interesting discussion, many interesting points raised. And I hope it's going to be a positive outcome for all of us. Thank you all for uh, being so candid, being so interesting. Thank you so much, Sodori, and thank you to both okay. our speakers. Uh, before I, I close, I would like to undo a mistake I did. I forgot to thank very cordially Siglisis and the World Human Forum for being a supporting organization in putting this, uh, this event today together. And thank you, Alexandra, and all of your team for helping us along with uh, preparing for this. Of course, I want to thank again the analysis. I don't need to say again how much it means for us that we work with your experience and also support from your fantastic team. I want to thank also our team in NEPLO, the European Public Organization, that have been doing all the work to put it up uh, to make this series of events happening. And most of all, I would like to thank all of our uh, participants and attendees. Uh, today we had close to 250 viewers, including those that were uh, following the event also on YouTube and for uh, this time also for the participation the very very strong participation with questions I mean it was not easy to deal with all the number of questions so I hope that you will keep them coming in the next events we're planning a next event for um, the 14th of May so you will all be notified about this and uh, on this I want to thank you again all very much and uh, of course there will be the recording that will be published on YouTube for those that will want to follow it again. See you again in two weeks time and thank you very much both our speakers and to Bye. Thank you Spiros.